All right, good evening, everybody. Good evening. All right, that's a lot better. Thank you. Uh, so I really want to appreciate uh, all of you coming out on what is uh, obviously uh, an unusual uh, weather evening in uh, South Florida. Uh, thanks for braving the rain. I uh, just want to introduce a few people before we get to the, uh, the main event. So as you know, uh, we are uh, honored to have Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits sponsoring the uh, Distinguished Leader Series now. So uh, let's give a big round of applause to Wayne Chaplin. Uh, Wayne, come and take a bow. And uh, also Arlene uh, Chaplin as well, who's an alum of the uh, uh, business school. Thank you very much. And uh, appreciate all of our other friends from Southern Glazers who are here uh, this evening. Uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, uh, other distinguished guests with us. So um, Anna Vega Milton, who's a trustee of uh, the university, is with us. Um, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, really appreciate uh, Neil Shah also, who's a member of our Real Estate Advisory Board. And um, um, by the way, there are vacancies on all of these advisory boards. For uh, anyone who's interested, please just slip me um, uh, an envelope after, uh, no, uh, a, uh, a business card afterwards. Um, now, in addition to Emil, uh, what really uh, I'm excited about this evening is that Emile's parents are here as well. So I really want to in acknowledge uh, George and Demi. Please stand up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's always always wonderful when uh, family members come with our with our speakers. So I'm not going to. Um, uh, go through all of Emile's background except to say that he's had a tremendous uh, career so far, very varied career, uh, started in consulting, then went to uh, investment banking with uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, basically had leadership positions in three uh, very successful startups. Uh, most people only get to claim one if they're lucky, but uh, he's had three bites at the apple. Uh, with uh, Tell Me first, and then Clout, uh, and then finally uh, with Uber. Uh, and now he's uh, living primarily in uh, Miami, uh, and uh, has uh, a leadership role in a uh, venture and private equity uh, initiative that he'll tell us, I'm sure, a little bit more about. So it's a wonderful story. We, we can't wait to, uh, to hear it. Uh, we're just so thrilled that uh, you could come. And before you come up, I want to acknowledge one other person here, who is Betsy Atkins. Uh, and the reason I'm acknowledging Betsy is that without Betsy's introduction, uh, Emil would not be here. So Betsy is a uh, very important non-executive director in many leading companies in the US, including uh, Wynn Resorts, which has had its uh, issues in the last uh, year, shall we say. Um, a very distinguished uh, non-executive director, so we're really thrilled that you were kind enough to introduce Emil to us, Betsy. Thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> All right. Emil, it's your turn. And uh, just, just, just take a look uh, before Emil comes up. Uh, I just want to remind everybody we're launching this fantastic new uh, master's degree in sustainable business in August. Uh, please make sure that... Uh, you send good applicants our way. That's the, the biggest gift that you can give to Miami Business School is to send good applicants to these outstanding programs that we have. In addition, we've just become a member of a five business school consortium covering Brazil, uh, Mexico, China, the Netherlands, and Miami now representing the US. Uh, this is a fantastic global MBA program for 40-year-old uh, executives, uh, hugely uh, well received in the international community, especially among multinational companies. So uh, again, if there's anyone you can think of who would benefit or would be interested, uh, please let us know or send them our way. And then finally, um, we have uh, our speaker, Emil. Thank you so much, please. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you, Dean. Appreciate the invitation, and thanks, Betsy, for uh, arranging it. It's an honor to be here at the University of Miami Business School. Um, I'm going to talk today about Uber and, and uh, how Uber became the world's global transportation leader in such a short time. Um, and so we'll uh, go for that. And then, I, and before that, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in, in the form of pictures, because uh, Dean said that people want to know you, but like make it make it bo less boring than it normally is, so I'll do my best. <laughs> um, uh -huh. All right. Okay. There we go. There we go. All right. Um, so I wanted to show, I want to show first, before I get into me, the one chart that changed my business career. The one reason I decided to join Uber, and it took me a while, as some people in the audience know, I spent two years meeting Travis Kalanick, the CEO, and say, should I join, should I not? It's a black car service for rich people. I don't know, it seems small. Um, and then we became friends, and I saw one chart in 2013, and it was this one. Um, what this chart is, is something called a net promoter score, which is actually a way of asking consumers how good they think your product is. You ask one question, would you recommend this product to a friend or colleague? And as you can see, Uber on the left is up there with Amazon and with, uh, and with Apple in terms of people loved it. Way higher than Google, which is in its 50s. But what's in the 50s, what's interesting though is you see the taxi um, net promoter score. It's minus 14. That means the competitor at the time, people were actively saying, do not take a taxi. It's terrible. Please don't do it. It's not, it's not worth it. <laughs> and if you see that gap, that gap Travis used to call Uber love. And I said, if a product has that much love on it and the competitors are that bad, there must be a globally interesting business here. And then I signed on. Um, so about me, uh, my parents were introduced. We, we uh, were born in Egypt. I was born in Egypt. We immigrated when I was a kid. This is one of my favorite pictures of sort of captures the immigrant story as, as you all know it. We grew up in New Rochelle, New York. Um, did college at Harvard and, and uh, law school at Stanford. Um, and then, to skip through the personal stuff, makes me uncomfortable, so <laughs> I'm going through it fast. My first company was Tell Me Networks in 1999. The internet bubble was inflating in 1999, if people remember. Um, and I joined this company. What Tell Me did was it had a speech recognition technology that uh, you would be able to call a phone number and speak to it like you were calling Google up and asking information. It would spit it back to you. This was in 1999, 12 years before Alexa, Siri, Google Home, all the things you know about today, where you speak to that device. And we were way ahead of our time, and as things are ahead of their time, they didn't work. <laughs> so we had to break down that business and rebuild another business. So now what Tell Me uh, eventually did was we answered phone systems for corporations. Like you call up American Express and you want to get your account balance. You speak to it, and it gives you your account balance. So we, we labored at that for nine years. We eventually built it into a, about a $100 million revenue business, and we sold it to Microsoft in 2007. Thankfully, before 2008, when the market started to crash, and we got a good price for it. Um, and it was sort of a success, but it took nine years uh, to do, and sort of where I'd, I'd say I learned my entrepreneurial grit, how to work harder, how to work smarter, how to change business models, um, and so on. It was a really a tough slog, but it ended up being a really good outcome uh, for Tell Me. And then Tell Me became one of these centers in the Silicon Valley, for those who know it, of sort of a, they call it the PayPal Mafia. There was a Tell Me Mafia. A lot of great people we hired went on to do great things. Uh, as I showed before, a lot of these people had uh, top jobs at Google and, and Apple and so on. Um, then I, I kind of took a break. I said, hey, I'm going to go do something that I think I was more passionate about. I was a government major in college. Maybe I want to do some public service. And so I applied for this White House Fellows Program in the first year of the Obama administration, got lucky and got it. And I got assigned to the Secretary of Defense, who at the time was a Republican named Robert Gates. Um, and I, I asked, I remember asking him, why did you choose me? He said, because you don't know anything about defense, so you kind of just sit there and not say anything. You won't bug us. We've got two wars to run. 
you don't know anything about it. And he was right, but uh, I worked hard and I got to spend time in Afghanistan and Iraq and Pakistan and Guantanamo Bay. I got to see the world from that perspective, learn how government worked. It was quite an exhilarating experience as you might imagine. Um, but it was definitely something I wasn't ready to do for a career. Uh, being in government, at least, uh, yeah, I think it's an honorable thing, but I was, felt I was too young to do it. So then um, I went back to the Valley and I joined this company called Clout. Um, what Clout did was basically take in all the data from social media, like from Facebook and Twitter and all these places, and it tried to discern who was influencing the conversation in the right way. Because right now you go on social media, there's a lot of yellers or trolls or whatever you call them. People who don't know what they're talking about. And they could, be, they could sway a lot, of, uh, a lot of public opinion. So the idea was to give someone a high rating when they had expertise. And God knows we've seen in the last year or two how important it is to have some editorial discretion in social media. Because if you don't, it's sort of a, a cacophony of voices and no one knows who to believe. And you get fake news, you get all these things. This business model also, model also didn't work. <laughs> it was also ahead of its time. Um, but we figured out a way to sell that for $200 million and Vista Equity ended up buying it. Um, so that was an okay, okay thing by the standards of the time. Um, but then I, I, during that time at Cloud, when I was spending time with Travis and I saw that one slide about how great the, the gap was, uh, the Uber love gap was between uh, Uber and taxis, um, I met Travis and said, I gotta do this, now, now I'm ready. And the company was about, it was really small at the time. And uh, we kind of created this role called the Chief Business Officer. Well, I did uh, primarily in charge of the fundraising. Uh, fundraising M&A, business development, and, and uh, our B2B business. I didn't think, I remember at the time Travis told me, he's like, I don't think we need to raise any more money. <laughs> Which is kind of a joke because Within the 30 months after my first day, we raised about $15 billion, which was the most of any private company collectively and any individual financing had ever raised before. And it, would be, it was part art, part science, but the reason that was important because we used that as fuel to, uh, for our global ambitions. Um, and if we had money, we felt we could, there was nothing we could conquer. Uh, and so that was my primary task. And then we had mergers and acquisitions. And as you might know, Uber has a big self-driving car division now with 1,500 um, PhDs trying to figure out how a car can drive itself. Um, and we had businesses in China and Russia, and we ended up doing mergers in those, those areas too. Uh, so that was my job. And I want to point one thing out here. Um, I joined Uber right about here. And this is where I'd say what the first part of the Uber revolution happened. And that's when they launched, or we launched, UberX. Most people in this room, I'm guessing, are Uber Black kind of con you know, customers, but UberX changed the game. UberX was cheaper than a taxi, and anyone with a car could start earning money by pushing a button, signing up, pushing a button, and signing up. That made all these cars out there that weren't being used 95% of the time money-making vehicles. And it changed the way the average person got around because all of a sudden you didn't have to call a taxi, you didn't have to wait for one. It was cheaper, it was even cheaper than parking, maybe driving yourself and parking. Certainly you didn't need to drink and drive anymore. Um, and the growth accelerated from here. You see this massive growth when we changed that that business model or added that to our business model. And this is, I think, a more important slide even. This is the San Francisco chart I just showed you. What we learned is let's just launch UberX everywhere else first. So all these other cities launched faster. And so you saw the growth curve almost go vertical because it was a revolution in the way people wanted to uh, get themselves around. And as it turns out, the same thing in Toronto, Tanzania, or Taipei, people all want to push a button and get a ride. And we learned that very early on in the business and our competitors were a little more tentative and we knew we had something. So um, that's, what the, what, that's what the fuel was for. Um, 
So I wanted to talk tonight about growth, because that's really the title of the, the talk here. How do we do what we did? Um, and it was about taking the cities we had launched in. We used to launch city by city by city. We consider our unit of scale the city. We would try to grow in that city as fast as we can. That meant launching new products from Uber Black to Uber X to Uber Pool to all the different things that you see of today. Uh, uh, we had an option for every price point. We had an option for people who wanted to pay a fare that was cheaper than the bus. Uh, that was Uber Pool. At some point, it got down to two or three bucks a ride. It was sort of blew, blew my mind. Um, and then we'd take those learnings and we'd launch in new cities. So you had this revenue growth curve that was sort of, you know, previously un, unimagined, unimaginable. Um, and then we launched Uber Eats and Uber Rush and Uber Freight. So we had this matrix, new cities, old cities, existing transportation products, new products like Uber Eats and Uber Rush, because we had this network of cars in the city that if they weren't taking people around, maybe they could be taking food around, or maybe they taking packages around. So we built what's, you can think of as kind of an urban logistics fabric across every big city in the world. Um, and so in this short time, and this will get to sort of Uber, what happened at Uber, um, and a lot of it comes down to this, we were a small company of 200 people when I joined, and in three, three and a half, four years, we were 15,000. Uh, we're in 50, 50 cities, and then we're in 1,000 three, four years later. 350 million, or about 70 billion valuation, all in three or four years. No. <sighs> gives me <laughs> gives me chills thinking about how hard that was. Um, <laughs> so how do we do it? Um, it's a question I'm asked more off, most often by entrepreneurs, is how did you all think to grow this company that fast? And I said, I tried to think in terms of this lecture, how do I boil it down to a couple of principles that can encapsulate what we did. And it's these three principles, ambition with vision, power to the people, and uh, bits and atoms. And I'll explain that last one in more detail because it's complex, but um, what is the ambition with vision? We had this tagline we used to go around saying that we wanted to make transportation as reliable as running water for everyone everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're in the back country of Montana or the the cent central business district in M M Mumbai, sorry, we wanted to make sure that you can get a ride in five minutes or less. Um, may not all be profitable in every single route, but we wanted to make sure that when you thought of reliable transportation, you thought of Uber. Um, and we learned that that works. We did it all over the world. We sent what we call a launcher into a city, and we told them, you launch, the way to launch a city is you go get enough drivers and enough riders to create liquidity. And liquidity means that you can push a button and get an Uber in five minutes or less. And you hire your replacement from the local market. So you're in India, you hire someone from India who's local to that city to hire that. And when you, when you do that, you can leave and go launch the next city. So we had an army of people who lived with, on suitcases and dropped into these cities to launch them. And we did that all at a, in a blitz scaling approach, we called it. Um, and this is, how, this is sort of how we did it. And when we did do it, we always thought of, we're gonna do Uber Eats, we're gonna do the next product set, so let's design what we do to be able to do all the other things we wanna do over time. Kept their credit card information, so that when we had Uber Eats, we could launch it that. We kept their credit card, you know, their, their, where they were home, uh, home in the app so that when they wanted delivery to or from home that we knew where they were, who they were. So we always designed the system to be extensible to new products. I mean, that was sort of an ambition of vision. Now, if you compare that to Lyft, our, our main U.S. competitor, they're in one country with one product. We're today, Uber today is in 70 countries with five products. And the difference between us and them was not sort of who had the idea, it was really the ambition. Um, and Uber became a verb, right? Social media, everything you can do, you could think of was done with an Uber. Babies were born in an Uber. In New York City, moms were, instead of calling an ambulance, they call me an Uber. And so we ended up making Uber onesies for <laughs> babies that were born in Uber. We'd run out of them. Um, and uh, stars would talk about it. It became a verb, it became a noun, I'm Ubering. Did you get an Uber? 
Did you Uber there even when they were taking a lift? It just became the way you talked about how you got around. Um, and it was quite an exciting time to be inside knowing that wherever you went in the world, the word Uber, it couldn't be translated in any language. So people in China would say Uber. So everyone used the same word all over the world. And it was so generic in that way that it applied to everyone. Um, so this is the more interesting one. I think it's a little bit of the untold story of, of Uber. And the reason we succeeded in a lot of ways is because we gave power to the people. Um, and now Uber seems like a big corporation, but what it was at the time was a way for people to say, I want something better from the transportation system, from my government, from the taxi system, from all the things that made it expensive, inconvenient, dangerous to go around the city. So let me give you some sense of what the rules were, because Uber gets a lot of, oh, you guys broke a lot of rules. We did, and I'll tell you what the, some of the rules were. In Korea, you can take a chauffeured car, an Uber essentially, someone driving it for money, so long as you're not Korean. So Korean citizens are not allowed by criminal penalty to get in the back of a car that's being driven by someone else for money. Um, Germany, you, draw, you take someone from the city center to the airport, drop them off, and there's a line of people waiting to go in the back to the city center. You are not allowed by law to take someone on that line and bring them back to the city. You have to go back to your base first, then go back to the airport to pick that person up. Um, our hometown in Miami, you had to uh, wait for an hour after you called the car. So you called the car, it showed up in your house in three minutes, you had to wait there for 57 minutes for you to get in the back of the car or the driver was committing a violation. Um, my favorite one is Los Angeles. They told the drivers what kind of socks to wear and what color shirts to wear. Um, and in London, you had to spend a year or more learning the streets of London in the age of Google, Google Maps. You spent a year of your life training, paying tuition, all that for something that could be done by a phone today. So yeah, did we bend those rules? Did we try to make sure that those rules were overdone? Of course. The one challenge we never figured out was that it wasn't necessarily the taxi drivers that were responsible for this. It was really the regulators and the taxi medallion owners. The drivers were actually quite exploited by, um, by the taxi system themselves. I don't know if you know how, how it worked in New York City, but the medallion owner, if you have the license to run a taxi in, in New York, you would essentially tell a driver, you pay me $300 a week for the right to use my license and the car. And if you earn less than that, that's your problem. If you earn more than that, you can keep, you can keep the difference. Um, and there's no health care, there's no, there's no nothing. You've got to work a 16-hour shift. And so it was, they were quite exploited. So we did pretty well getting a taxi driver over who, uh, who didn't own the medallion. Right now, if, you, if they did own the medallion, it's a little bit of a different story because they put their own money, took a loan, and bought a medallion. And that's a little bit of what you're seeing today. It was the, tough, the taxi drivers that are left are really the ones who are the, the owners of these taxi medallions. And I don't think that problem is solved yet. Um, these drivers were proud. These were the early drivers. They would take their sons or daughters on the road with them. They would try to, it was a really, it was kind of a family business at first. And we handheld these drivers through learning how to use an app for the first time. In 2011, most drivers didn't have smartphones. So we would lend, lend them smartphones. And we'd teach them how to use an app and try, and for them, connect it to their bank accounts so they'd get paid. All this stuff was very manual in the early days. I remember our first office at Uber, at any given time, there was more drivers than employees in the office because we were handing out phones to them and making it work and the app was busted and this and that. So uh, we spent a lot of time getting to know these drivers. I'm still friends with a lot of these guys today. Um, this is the other power to the people moment. The, the one biggest risk we had from a regulatory standpoint in Uber was Mayor de Blasio tried to put a cap on the number of Uber cars in the city. And the reason why a cap doesn't work is because if you cap the number of cars, well then you have more demand on the system, and all of a sudden, I can't guarantee you a five minute ride, a five minute wait time. It could go up to seven minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, who knows. And it turns out he took a lot of donations from the taxi medallion owners. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So 
what we did is we had an email campaign and phone campaign. We put it in every, every app. You open the app and you're an Uber user. We said, look at the de Blasio view. There's no cars available. Pre you pressed it and it automatically called your city councilman. And automatically emailed. We flooded the zone to make sure the city council knew that this was not acceptable. And uh, this is a New York Post cartoon. The day before the vote um, that Yellow was my new green. <laughs> yellow taxis were the way he made money for his campaigns. Um, and it was the first bill in New York City history where the mayor and president of city council supported it that got dropped and got defeated. And so it was a quite a, a powerful moment to have riders and drivers on the city steps, the city hall steps saying no more. No more late, no more being overcharged. No more uh, you know, preferring your donors as opposed to us. No more uh, not being able to take a taxi to Harlem if you're a person of color, no more. People were fed up and it was quite a moment and that cascaded all over the world. Um, so this is the last sort of concept, bits and atoms. So a bit, a computer bit is sort of a piece of code. The software doesn't really exist in the world. An atom is something that exists in the world. We're all, we're all made of atoms and so on. The tech companies of the last generation, Facebook, Google, so on, they're really bits companies, right? You type in google.com anywhere in the world, it finds its way to some computer, answers your you know, spits out an answer back to you and sends it to where you are. So you could serve the whole world by one computer farm sitting wherever the Google wants it to be. In fact, it's kind of distasteful to have too many employees at a company that's about bits, because what they're about is reducing the need for humans. Uber would never have existed if we didn't have enough humans on the ground in every city, knocking on drivers' doors uh, and windows saying, hey, do you want a better chance? Do you want a chance to make more money? Um, at the events in that city, like this one, outside, we'd be handing out leaflets, try Uber, try Uber, try Uber. Um, and we weren't afraid of combining bits and atoms in a business, saying if we're gonna hire people and we're gonna use technology and we're gonna use both of them to launch in all these places all over the world. Um, and that was innovative at the time. Today you see it all over the place. All the food delivery companies are a combination of technology and people. Like someone has to deliver the stuff to you. Until, until a robot could do it, we need, we need humans to do it. And I think we ushered in at Uber a whole generation of companies that are not afraid to put humans on the ground in every country in the world, in every city in those countries, to make a business work. And I think you'll see more of that in the coming years. So Uber had a lot of controversy in 2017, if not for its whole career. I guess the lessons I've learned from that are, you know, the business was growing like this. The company buildings wasn't growing as fast. And what I mean by that is, as the comp business is growing, you've got to marry that with HR, finance, legal, all the things that make a corporation stable over time and successful. It's also the kind of thing that can make a company not innovative. So the art is how do you put enough structure in place to tame this wildly growing entity without uh, taking innovation out? It's known as innov the innovator's dilemma, right? So I think we were, we were way tilted on the innovation side and less worried about the structures to make this company something that would uh, sort of catch up with the growth. So you see it, all the problems you saw were essentially down to that, in my view. Um, and that is really just systems. Like you have to have systems in place, controls, rules, all that stuff. It's just when you tell an entrepreneur that, they're like, well, I haven't won yet. I can't put in rules and say I can't do this or that or shouldn't do this or that because we haven't, we haven't won yet. And we sort of have a we haven't won yet mentality. So if I had to do it all over again, I probably would have strengthened those functions and made sure that we had built those things at the same pace that we were building the business. Um, so for the entrepreneurs in the audience, or the would-be entrepreneurs, my favorite quote, um, Teddy Roosevelt, it is not hard, it is extremely hard to build a business. There is no doubt that your victories are magnified, as are your defeats, your mistakes are magnified, and so you have to be willing to choose to be the guy or gal in the arena, taking, you know, getting sweaty, working hard, figuring out uh, a path to disrupting an industry. And if you don't, is, uh, that job's not for you, and that's okay. I think we need all kinds of people. But it is one of those things where people say to you, you know, how do you think about Uber in retrospect? It was the greatest business experience of my life, 
And I do it all over again with all the puts and takes that you had because you know, I'm kind of built that way. So uh, that is all, uh, Dean Welch. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for taking the yeah. film. All right, we're going to open it up to uh, questions shortly, but uh, I thought I'd start with just, uh, just a couple. Um, so pick, picking up on uh, one of the last points, which is the business grows faster than the company. And can you talk a little bit about uh, the evolution of the company culture in particular um, and, and how that is challenged when you have such a rocket ship in terms of sales growth? Yeah, so the, when you have a rocket ship in, in terms of sales growth, you have sort of a multiplying problem. The more countries you launch in, the more products, the more distant you are from every, mm -hmm. everyone in the field. So it's harder to direct activity because there's so much activity going on and that activity multiplies in complexity by language, by currency, by product line, um, you name it. <clears throat> and so I think the culture that is sort of frontier entrepreneurialism, I'll call it, which is just drop someone in, um, in Egypt and let's see, if, let's see what they could do. Um, that kind of entrepreneurialism, I think, has to morph culturally into something that's, we've learned a lot. What kind, let's like, think about what bets we, want. we have to take next and want to take them and let's just be smarter about doing that. And by the way, we don't have to be in everywhere tomorrow. You know, let's do you know, this country tomorrow, this country next week and whatever. Instead, we said, go out and just win. Uh, and I think as you got bigger, it just got harder to manage. Right. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned China and Russia as two markets I think you were quite involved yeah. uh, in setting up. Um, can you compare and contrast wh which was tougher? Great question. I spent probably 150 days in China over, over this period. It was, I really loved the challenge of that. No American tech company had ever had an on-the-ground on business, tech business of this sort. And I, I would joke, if I, if I got a free ride for everyone told me, uh, everyone who told me I was gonna fail in China, I'd have free rides for life. But, uh, uh, you know, even the, so what's interesting about China is the mayors there and the people who run the, the, the various cities, they wanted competition to their homegrown competitor. Mm -hmm. They liked us there. We were kind of, they were, we were minor celebrities there because they're like, please don't leave. If you leave, I've got this monopoly on my hands. Um, so we're really welcome there. I'd say in Russia, not so much, right? <laughs> it was much more of a, you know, a much harder, a much more difficult country to penetrate mm -hmm. um, in that way. We did a good job, but, um, but the rules can change fairly quickly. Whereas in China, they're, they're very thoughtful about the rules. You know when they're coming, and they don't change them very often. So that's sort of, I would operate in a predictable environment as opposed to unpredictable any day. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the difference between those two. I was uh, just in Vancouver yesterday. That's a no-go Uber no -go. city. No Ubers in Vancouver um, killing their convention business. How, how do you uh, deal with that or do you not even bother? Well, no, no, you bother because these cities, if you, what we used to talk to investors when we raised all this money, what is a city worth? If, you, if that's a, you know, how, what is Uber worth? Well, what, are the, what is the sum of each city? In a city like San Francisco, and San Francisco's got 800,000 people, maybe five million in the greater San Francisco area, the market cap of, of that city is probably $3 billion. So Vancouver's not, it's probably worth a billion or $2 billion. So you can't quit on a place like Vancouver or a country like Germany or Spain or Italy, which effectively still ban Uber to this day, as does Japan. So I do think you have to go, and so is South Korea. There's still a lot of industrialized com countries where you cannot get an Uber. Um, and I think you have to keep fighting until you do. Eventually people, if you're Korean, you're gonna travel outside the country, you're like, why can't I have this? What, 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 what did I do wrong? <laughs> and I think eventually the people power will come in these places too and, and cause them to change. Government relations then is a huge part of the success of this business, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the, um, uh, the two other companies, what did you learn in each of those other companies that uh, helped you do an even better job at Uber? So I guess one of the things I learned 
in, in the Silicon Valley generally, but particularly these two companies, is it is hard to under it is it is really hard to undervalue people. Um, meaning the quality of your team is paramount, and, and that may be specific to the tech business. I don't think so, but surround like pe good people are expensive, and I learned that's okay. You want great people around you who are going to fight the fight, who are smart and resilient, who are flexible. And if I give you more of my share, that's okay because the, the pie is going to be bigger. So that mentality I learned through these two companies is better people will make a bigger pie. And that's the, that's the way to run a business like this. What did you learn from uh, Gates? Gates. Um, Bill, uh, Bob Gates, Robert Gates, who was the Secretary of Defense under Bush and Obama, the first and only Secretary of Defense ever to serve under an administration of either party, of both parties. Um, he's an extraordinarily honorable man. Uh, I wish he was still there in some ways in that job because he did it very well. Um, he's, a, he's a high integrity guy, so he, he leaned into hard problems. That's what I learned him from him. He's like, don't, it's easy to procrastinate and avoid hard problems. Instead, do the opposite, lean into them. Um, and that's good in the business world too, because especially if you're a leader in a business, finding the problem is actually a problem. Mm -hmm. So if you sniff one, leaning into them and trying to solve them as you see them, as opposed to letting them fester, is sort of the best business lesson I took. From What's him. the biggest mistake you've ever made? <laughs> um, biggest mistake? I should have joined Uber two years earlier. <laughs> a huge financial mistake. Um, <laughs> Still went okay, but that was a big mistake. Um, I'd say that. Are you looking for a bigger one? I mean, that's pretty big. <laughs> I'd say that I wish I'd learned the lesson I told today, which is the company building piece of this mm -hmm. earlier on, because I think we could have saved a lot of heartache for employees, investors, and so on, mm -hmm. which is just to be focused not only on conquering the world, but building the machinery that could like effectively, you know, make you effective in conquering the world. Mm -hmm. Um, so I definitely learned that for my next one. What, what made you leave uh, Goldman Sachs? You had a charmed existence. <laughs> you were Harvard. You were yeah, Goldman. Yeah. Um, why, why, why make the switch? You know, you ever, and people in this room probably know this, but y y if you're at a whatever place of work and you look at the people who are 20 years your senior and you're like, do I want to be a banker? They're fine people. I just didn't want that lifestyle. Um, they were, for me, it was a little more around the edge than in the mix. Um, it's sort of the outside the arena, not in the arena, uh, and it just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Goldman was a great place. Again, what, uh, the thing I learned from Goldman that was the best lesson is the high quality people mm -hmm. thing. High quality people, pay them well out of your pocket because the pie's bigger. And I think to this day, they're still, they still do that and that's why they're the best. Tell us about your mom and dad. <laughs> um, Gosh, um, you know, they were, we were Coptic Christians in Egypt, 10% minority. So, you know, uh, it's a better place to be in America than to be in that group there from an opportunity standpoint. So, you know, having the courage in their 30s to come, to come here for my sister and I is pretty, pretty overwhelming and something I feel like you end up wanting to pay back kind of forever. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of nice to have them here to see this kind of thing. What, what was so special about that photograph? Uh, well, you've got the liberty piece behind it. You've got a smiling mother and father. You have me not knowing whatever, but, <laughs> like, but uh, it's sort of one of those pictures that encapsulates the politics and the immigration and the opportunity and where I am today sort of the best for me. Okay, yeah. let's open it up. Who's yeah. got a question? Students, please, hands raised. We've got the mics. Why don't we take uh, this gentleman here first? Oh, welcome to uh, Miami, Mr. Michael. So actually, uh, after I graduated from UM Business School, my first professional certification was uh, Tell Me Studio Training. So uh, thank you for that, and uh, that actually it really helped a lot. Uh, it's really well done. And so my question is, I mean, you survived the first dot-com crash, um, and then you sold, the you sold Tell Me before the second crash. So did the first crash inform you about what was coming? Like, could you sense the business conditions changing after surviving the first one? Um, for sure. That first crash, anyone who's been through it was scared, scared out of their minds. I mean, 
you had companies going down, you know, 90, 95% overnight within a week or two, um, and everything evaporating, bankruptcies, lawsuits, you know, it was, it was chaos. So what Tell Me had done, luckily, is in August of 2000, and the, so the wheels started to come off in March, and then by, by the end of 2000, by October, November, they're off. August 2000, we raised $100 million. And when the, thing, the wheels came off in October, we kind of laid half the company off and said, we have this pile of cash. Let's rebuild a sustainable business because that's the only thing that's going to work. You know, there was no like pets.com stuff that you were going to get out in an IPO. You had to build a real business all of a sudden. So um, that, we learned that lesson right there. And sometimes I lament, had to tell me gone bankrupt or something, mm -hmm. you know, I might end up joining Google or some other company that started in 03, 04. Um, but you know, we didn't want to let our investors down, and they were laning employees. So we, we hustled and built a big business based on that. You know, seeing what was happening, the carnage that was happening around us. I mean, and the way you could tell it was that there's this, you know, in Silicon Valley, there's this Highway 101. It was just the traffic on the 101 went from, you know, two-hour commute up to San Francisco down to like 45 minutes <laughs> inside of a month because all these jobs were lost. People left town. It was amazing. Um, gentleman on the aisle. Yeah, hi. Uh, great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is related to uh, some recent events in the sense that what do you think of uh, owners uh, going for uh, super voting rights and how Uber, if and when it does go for IPO, will not do so? Uh, and, you know, you advising a, a, a firm which is invested in Snap and Lyft. Yeah. So how, how, do, how what do you think of that? Yeah. Well, I'll give you my first, maybe, my maybe, personal maybe opinion. Maybe just explain yeah. the issue so everyone so, knows what he's talking about. Sure. So a lot of tech companies that in, uh, in Silicon Valley have a voting structure that gives the founders of that company super voting control of the company. So it's not one share, one vote. So every shareholder gets one vote, and it's just whatever happens, happens. They say, well, I get 10 votes for every one you get. And that allows them, in theory, the theory is that they get to make longer term decisions that are not subject to stock market fluctuations. So if something goes down, an activist investor can't do something to throw the founder out or to change the business strategy. So Google has this, Facebook has it, the founders of those companies have it. Jeff Bezos at, Apple, at uh, Amazon does not have it. Steve Jobs didn't have it. So the argument would be that, well, by force of personality or by, by force of how good you are, you don't need it, is one side of the argument. And the other side is, well, you better, it's good to keep it just in case. Um, at Uber, we had it, but we, in sort of part of the mess of 2017, it got given away, and Lyft, our competitors, didn't ever have it, and now they're asking for it before they go public. Um, I actually think it's generally a good thing. And the reason is, is that some of these technology bets take, could take a decade, 15 years, 20 years to play out. I'll give you a good example. Google Maps. Everyone uses Google Maps one way or the other. Google bought this company 10 years ago for a billion dollars called Keyhole and their investors thought they were crazy. And even today, there's no, they don't make money from Google Maps, but everyone uses it, and someday they're gonna make money, but they've invested probably $10 billion of it over time. No investors would, would, uh, would vote for that, but they did it, and that I do think is gonna be an incredibly valuable asset. It's changed lives, it's changed the world. If they have two billion monthly users, it's an incredible asset that they built. Those kinds of things don't get built if founders can't withstand an activist shareholder. So I'm kind of in favor, generally, of those things. Okay. Um, lady in the uh, back, uh, at the back, please. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so, yes. <laughs> uh, so now with Boeing entering the air taxi or drone business, do you think there would be a competition or maybe merge forces with them? So, um, so the news is that Boeing, the airplane manufacturer, I guess they make helicopters too, and they're thinking, do they get into the business of pushing a button and getting a helicopter ride as opposed to a car? And I do think that eventually there will be services like that in some places where you can on demand get a helicopter, maybe places like Sao Paulo that have a lot of helicopter landing pads on the route. There's places where that could be okay. There's a theory that eventually we'll have autonomous helicopters that could just like go up in a city and they all know each other are so there won't be danger of crashing. I think all that stuff's kind of a decade out, far enough out that it's hard to predict if who's gonna be competing with who. 
Um, but I think the hardware manufacturers pretty much ought to stick to hardware manufacturing and the service providers ought to stick to providing service. So, you know, I don't think Uber's gonna make vehicles. They should leave that to Ford and Toyota. Uber can make the software and the app. Uh, and Boeing probably ought to just make the planes and figure out how to partner in that way. That's my best guess for 10 years okay. from now. Thanks. Um, <coughs> lady in the, uh, uh, yes, thank you. Hi, thank you so much for, for being here. I really enjoyed the talk. So earlier in, the, in, in your introduction, it was mentioned that now you are involved in some venture capital and private equity uh, business matters. So my first question would be, what are you doing right now? <laughs> and then uh, my second question would be, how do you see, what do you like of Miami as a growing tech scene? Um, great questions. I, so I'm advising a hedge, a hedge fund and private equity fund called Co2 in New York right now. Spent a little bit of my time on that. I'm right now in idea mode. I'm thinking about what I think of the next big ideas and how I, do I go build a company that, that around one of these ideas? Do I invest in a company around one of these ideas? So uh, I'm working on those right now. Um, so we'll see what I come up with. I got a couple, couple of them I'm, I'm working on with some friends. Um, and the second question was about Miami. Miami. I think that um, it's, a, it's an important and growing tech scene. There's a lot of people who've moved here, particularly in the last two, three years, and I think you'll see more over the next two, three years. And I think the thing we need to find here is sort of dense, dense cluster of engineering talent that can help sort of, there's no shortage of business ideas in Miami. I think you want the tech talent to match it. And I think there are some people in this audience here who are, are magnets for those kinds of people. So I think over the next couple of years, you'll see all you need is a couple thousand great engineers who are trading ideas in the ecosystem to make it a cluster. And I think it's, it's entirely possible that this becomes one here. Problem is it's too fun to live here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found that, but no, I all do right. think it's important. In, um, in the white shirt. <laughs> hey there. Thanks for hey. a great talk. Yeah. Uh, my name is Luis Martinez Moure. I work on the strategy team at Instacart, and I used to work in partnerships for Delta Airlines. And my question's about B2B relationships, specifically with Google and you guys, kind of started when you started, and I wanted to ask how you know. I don't want to get into the auto stuff. I'm more interested in why did you make the decision to kind of part ways? I think you mentioned you know, service providers sticking to service providers and uh, hardware companies sticking to hardware, so I wanted to get your thoughts there since it sounds like you might have been there right at the beginning and saw the, the transition over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. That's great, I love Instagram by the way. Like, I, I got to know Perva, who's the CEO of that company quite well, I think a great opportunity. Um, so, so what he's talking about is, is the Google-Uber partnership, which was fractious and difficult. So, so the, first, the start of it is that Google invested $250 million or so in Uber in 2013. Good for them, that stake's worth, you know, I'm guessing, about 20x now, it's probably worth $7 billion. So you figure like, hey, you make a partner a lot of money, that's, that's great, they ought to be happy. Instead, I think they thought of us as competitive because uh, they had a driverless car vision and we did because we had to for Uber, you know, eventually you have to have driverless cars there. So it became contentious and it ended up in some crazy IP lawsuit. Um, I guess what I learned is I prefer my investors not to have, to be investors and not be another business. Because you always, especially with the tech companies as big and sprawling as Google, has so many interests. Eventually your interests are collide and it gets really messy. Because they're on your boards, so they're hearing about what you're doing, they're making money from you, we're buying service for them. It's sort of, the complexity is, is real. Um, and you know, these big, I think, Google is, you know, is voracious in their competitive appetite, and as you see from a lot of these big tech companies, and I think startups just have to be worried about that a little bit, partnering with big companies like that. It's just tough, because they, get the, they have the data, they have the means, they have the money, they have the engineers, they have a lot of stuff, so you gotta be more thoughtful about it. If I had to do it all over again, I probably just wouldn't take in their money. We could've gotten money someone else, and it would've been a fine arm's length relationship. Yeah. Uh, let's take a couple more. Uh, gentleman on the aisle here. Blazer. Good evening. Uh, you mentioned bits and atoms uh, as of today. Moving to the future, I think maybe bits will overcome atoms somehow. 
What would be the implications of that in your view uh, for the 3 million drivers and how much cost reduction can the consumer expect due to this technology advancement? I think driverless cars are farther out there than sort of the optimists think. Um, it's a hard technology, right? You have to distinguish between a little kid running around the roll or a, a plastic bag trembling in the wind, right? Where you would just drive through it because you know it's a plastic bag. So you have to have depth perception. There's all kinds of really hard problems to solve. Um, I think they will get solved in our lifetime, but, but it's not the year, you know, I think Google said they were gonna do their first truly driverless car trips this year, it didn't happen. Elon Musk was gonna send a car across the country without a driver, it didn't happen. You know, so these things are gonna take longer. Um, I'd say that when they do happen, the electronics you have to put on the car are gonna be more expensive than a human driver. So it'll be a long time before the actual cost of the components that make a driver's car work, when it does work, uh, be able to reduce the cost for you. But in 20 years, could you imagine free rides that are advertising supported because you're in a car and someone wants to market you? Sure, could you, you know, or a dollar ride here or there. Um, you could imagine the cost of rides going close to zero in the long, long term. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple more. Uh, gentlemen, uh, you've been waiting a while. Yes, sir. Uh, just hold on to the mic, please. So, I've been involved with language and communication throughout my career. I'm retired now, chairman of a PR firm here. You talked about Uber as a verb and a noun, and I, I'm, I was very interested in that, but I'm interested in how the name Uber evolved or, or was determined. In the first place, it sounds like it's a great word, almost like Kodak. <laughs> um. <laughs> I believe Uber means elevated in German, so an elevated experience. Um, and it was neutral as to language. And Uber was first called Uber Cab. It was the first name of it. And then we got a cease and desist letter from the city of San Francisco because the word cab implied that it was a taxi and we weren't a taxi. So they were told, we were told to like get cab out of the name, thank God, because Uber is a better name than Uber Cab. Um, <laughs> and uh, we changed the name to, to just Uber. Um, and so that's how it came out. It was nothing more than that. And the website was available, so we got that. Uh, it was kind of a, you know, a simple story. I do think what, one of the interesting stories about this was that um, Uber.com was owned by Universal Music. And we gave them, we traded like 4% of Uber for the, for the URL, which would have been 4% of 70 billion kind of a lot, right, $2.8 billion for a URL. <laughs> Except, when we were running out of money, they were like, holy crap, we don't want this stock. And so we bought it back from them for like a, a million bucks. And so, <laughs> I've always wondered who the guy who sold that back to us is, <laughs> and if he still has his job, because it was a $3 billion mistake right there. So the idea of elevated. Elevated. Above. Above the cab. Above. All right, uh, one, one, one last one. Yeah, we'll go to the back, uh, the gentleman in the middle. Uh, hold on for the mic, please. What's the future of flying cars on dedicated routes? Um, so all these things get mixed in my head a little bit. A flying car, a flying helicopter, a flying plane, a vertical takeoff and landing plane, there's sort of some version of it takes off and you skip traffic and land somewhere, right? Um, I, I think that that future is just like with drones that pick up and except they have goods, not people. I think you'll see homes built with drone landing pads for deliveries. That'll be sort of the first thing that starts flying through the air, especially in suburbs. And right now they're doing drone deliveries of medicine and rural areas will see drone delivery of goods. Delivery of people is a hard one because of the liability and how, how great it has to be. And I do think once you start to, I think the, what'll happen is just like with Uber, people will launch these things and then people in the city will be like worried about things dropping out of the sky and then they'll get regulated. So I do think that tech will be ready before the regulations are ready on anything in the sky. So I think you're talking you know, a good 15, 20 years before you kind of literally can 
go outside the parking lot, get in a, a sp you know, space-like capsule and show up at your house in two minutes. Okay. How, how many people here have taken Uber in the last week? Okay. How many well, have taken a taxi in the last week? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably all traveling together as well. <laughs> all right. Thanks all right. a lot. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, you. Thanks, Thanks. So, uh, bef before you all uh, leave, if I could hold you for a moment. So, you know, one of the things that uh, Emil mentioned was the, uh, the power of people and the importance of having the right people in your organization. So, there's someone here this evening I want to acknowledge publicly, and that's Rob Becht. Rob, would you stand up, please? Um, so, Rob is the... Uh, Rob is the Executive Director of Finance and Administration at uh, Miami Business School. Uh, he has done a phenomenal job in that role. He is moving uh, at the end of next week to be the Executive VP of the Jewish Health System of Miami. It's a real loss for our school, but uh, uh, it's a really great uh, advance for Rob in his career. He's an alum of our school. Uh, we wish him well and we thank him for his service. Thank you. Thanks again.